the driver's door, ran out the side of the car, across the front of it, and jumped right off the side of the bridge in front of me. The only people that really pulled over were truckers. He said, we're going to Hodge, and he didn't slow down. He went across the median onto the oncoming traffic, but where they could see him coming, they just got out of the way. I noticed this plane was really low. He went right in front of us, hit the fence, and it spun around. You know, 30 seconds more, he could have hit us. And I went around that truck and a guy stepped out from behind the truck and threw a piece of wood and it shot through my window just like a spear and stuck in the back of the cab of my truck. That's probably one of the stranger things I've seen. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to Hammer Lane Legends. I am a host of the show. My name is Tony Merkel, and alongside of me is Brian Merkel, and I call him Dad. So, Dad, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? I'm doing fine. I am really excited about this podcast, and this is a podcast that I've been thinking about for... Uh, going on two years now. And, you know, when I first started the idea of this podcast, I started it on my own and it didn't really go anywhere because I was busy with my other podcast. And uh, I did one interview with a guy named Kevin, who we will be talking with later on in this episode, or I will be because you weren't on that one. But, uh, you know, it was a really interesting experience that he had. And he was actually, he's been a trucker for years, going up and down the East Coast of uh, the United States into Canada. And uh, he actually had seen some wild things. And one of the things that he's saw was actually somebody that committed suicide right in front of him off the ambassador bridge wow yeah and so can we can you imagine seeing something like that while you're in the truck i cannot i cannot imagine watching that happen can't imagine you're going down i just cannot imagine yeah i I mean it's it's very surreal i mean uh you think about you know people that die in your life and you know at least i do maybe i'm just morbid but (laughs) i i often think about like for instance we had a a driver at work now i'm a trucker you're a trucker we're both uh ltl guys you drive uh, drive line hall right and i drive uh pedal the city and so you know i was at work last month or not last month but last year and i got the news that we lost a driver at work and i'm not talking about loss like he didn't come in that day because he died at home like he literally died in his truck and it it hit me hard right uh he was an older guy he's planning on retiring and i i i got kind of close with him over the years and stuff, uh, we would actually go and get our DOT physicals the same day. So, hey, I'll meet you there. And then we go to the uh, the DMV and sit there for four hours talking while we're waiting in line. <laughs> you know, the, the, the process that we have to yeah, go through as truckers. To the truckers world. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's a whole day thing. It's like, hey, I got to do my physical. Okay, see you at midnight. You right. know? <laughs> right. Yeah, the DMV closes at five. But after that day, we need to go to the bar and have a drink. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he actually, he died in the truck where he was doing delivery and him and I used to drive the same area. Like he would start at six o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. and I would start at nine 30. And so I'd see him up there in the afternoon kind of thing. And, um, he did a pickup. He picked up some freight and he walked out to his truck and, uh, three hours later, they're closing the business down and this truck's still in the dock and they go wow. over and he's just, lay- he's just sitting in his seat he dead. And they said it was a massive heart attack. And so it probably happened pretty quickly, but the idea of, of hit being in his shoes and thinking about the fact that you know something's seriously wrong and if if death was going to feel like something this is what it's probably going to feel like right and not having the opportunity to say goodbye to your loved ones not to you know forget about your coworkers right the people that you love and that you spend your life with and so kevin driving over that bridge and seeing this guy just jump and there's a whole story leading up to it sure like i can't imagine being in kevin's shoes and seeing that because you literally see life become death right before your eyes yes. unexpectedly yes. it's got to be intense oh, it is I, I can i can only imagine what it's like because i've never seen it happen but when you think about something like that you think that's scary and like you said it, it's a surreal situation It is not the everyday thing that you see. Yeah. (laughs) To see that when you're in your truck, as you're driving by, has just got to be creepy. Big time. And sad at the same time. You're watching someone, the end of their life, you're watching it happen. Mm -hmm. Or at least they're trying to make the end of their life happen. 
Yeah. That has got to be a, a just a scary, scary situation. And and that's the thing. I mean, we're we're truckers and we see wild things out on the road. Yes, we do. Uh, and I can tell the audience right here on episode one, we have some interviews lined up with people who have seen wild things, planes crashing, and then the drivers pull over and they're helping people out of a plane that crashed. And we had a, a, a guy coming on who uh, was a civilian driver in Iraq. Right. And uh, he talks about being hauling, I think it was what was it? A hundred thousand pounds of fuel. Yes, a hundred thousand gallons of fuel. Yeah, hundred thousand pounds. Hundred thousand pounds. Yeah, uh, of fuel over landmines. Yep, under bypasses that were rigged to blow when he went under. Yeah, as a civilian driver, he wasn't even in the military. He volunteered to do this. Yes, that's what's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> After the first month, he stayed. Yeah, yeah. And so that's going to be on episode two for you guys uh, after this episode. But um, we have a great lineup of guests that are planning on coming up and joining the show. And I'm just really excited about talking with drivers about their wild experiences. Yes. Uh, we all have them, you know, and, and some aren't as extreme. Like most people don't go over to Iraq and have a <laughs> right. bunch, a whole country shooting at them every time they drive their truck, right? Right, exactly. And live to tell about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, we see so much stuff out in the roads and we all have these experiences that, you know, make you pinch your butt cheeks together because you're like, that, holy right. crap, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I got in the industry um, driving LTL and I was fortunate because uh, most drivers that get into the industry have to work their way into good jobs. Right. And I mean, you went through that hoop. I mean, yep. what, was it, what was it like for you starting out as a truck driver? Like you got your CDL, right? but now- well, who's going to hire you? Right, exactly. It's it's getting that that experience. I mean, you know, I started out peddling produce, you know, doing the 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 produce type of stuff. You know, you're going to to um, institutional kitchens and stuff like that, and delivering, and you know, moving up from there. The next thing was was doing LTL for a small little company in in Easton, PA, and you know, going from there to a bigger company and and doing bulk tankers. And uh, eventually getting where I'm at now, you know, but it, it was a process. Yeah. It was a process. And I remember seeing you go through the process. Yeah. And so the company you're at now, you've been there for how long? Uh, 22 years going. I'm, I'm in my 23rd year now. Okay. And I'm not even going to talk code. It's Pitt, Ohio Express. We're yeah. proud of that, right? Yeah, exactly. And so um, you started there when I was 12. Yep. I work for them now. Uh, but I saw you go through the process of getting to Pitt, Ohio. Right. I remember as a kid how happy you were when you got hired by well, Pitt, Ohio. That right. It was like it was like one of the companies you were shooting for, and uh, you had to get your experience in. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned about the the company uh, in Easton. You don't work there anymore. We, we're going to drop the name Johnson Motor Lines. You got it. Because Johnson. Was it just like a year or two ago? You saw the tractor you used to drive for them twenty some years ago. Exactly, the very same tractor for the same company. Stop. They never bought any new, no, no new equipment. You know, crazy. Yeah, crazy stuff. And and those are the kind of things that most drivers have to go through as far as jumping yes. through hoops uh, to get to a good job. Now, I was fortunate because you've been at Pitt, Ohio for 20 some years. Yep. You recommended me. They brought me in under that recommendation uh, and it worked out for me. Thankfully. It, yeah, thank it worked out for me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know what? There's been uh, drivers uh, that have gotten their son's jobs at Pitt since I've been there and the sons were fired and I... I can't imagine how that conversation goes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? that, 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 that changes Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like you embarrassed me, you know? Uh, I, I've seen it a couple of times and stuff. But, you know, it, it's one of those things where when I got hired there, uh, I, I spent most of my 20s just trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where I was like, you know, you know, my wife has been holding down a job for seven plus years or whatever it was. And I was just jumping around trying to figure out what I wanted to do with myself. And I, I had the CDL and I was like, you know, I need to start driving and I need to get serious about it. And so I called you up and, uh, you know, I asked you 
if you recommend me and you're like, are you sure? <laughs> you <know? laughs> That's my name. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, it's like, you know, the industry, and I didn't know at the time, but the industry, it takes a toll on you. Oh, and, it does. And I, I, I saw it through you, but you don't truly know until you're actually in those shoes right. on how much time is taken from your life when it comes to driving truck. And we all commit to that as drivers. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, you got me in there and stuff. And I remember during the interview, uh, I, <laughs> uh, I pride myself on being able to talk to people. Mm -hmm. And if I meet you for the first time, chances are I'll find something to talk to you about. Uh, I just, I really enjoy talking to people. I learned it from you. That's why we're podcasting together because this is what people are going to hear is just natural for us. It's just the right. chemistry we have. We talk and this is what we do. Um, and so I sat down in the interview with my boss and uh, it was going well. The interview was going well. And I was like, man, this is in the bag in the bag <laughs> and i got too relaxed <laughs> and he threw me a question that i i just didn't expect like you you kind of brainstorm about what they're going to ask and all that stuff right and he asked me a question and i can't remember the exact way he said it but he asked me about accidents he's like something like how do you feel about accidents well, that's a kind of an odd question right it is an odd question and and it, it kind of caught me off guard and so in the in the People understand this, like you're in the moment and time slows down and your mind's moving a million miles an hour and you're trying to think of the answer right. as your mouth is about to open because you got to act like you're on, on, the, on the ball and ready to answer things. And I said, accidents happen. <laughs> 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 his face, his face, like you just, you could literally, you could literally see his face, like his head almost like sunk down. Like he was like looking at the top of his glasses at me. If he had glasses on, like, did this guy really just say this? <laughs> and, then, and in that moment though, it, it, as fast as it came out of my mouth and as fast as I wish I could grab those words and push them back in my mouth, I, I followed it up with but I believe 99% of the accidents are avoidable. There you go. <laughs> and, and I, Good say. Yeah. And I told him, I said, you know, there are times out in the road that, you know, people are doing wild things around you. Yes. And you learn and you, I'm sure you do this because I do it. You, you read traffic you read yeah, you do the best you can yeah. anyway too and and you find that you can actually predict what people are going to do in front of you a lot of times just by yes. being you as a professional driver being observant and you can see somebody's on the phone you see that they've been swerving and so they're either smacking the kid in the back seat or they're texting their husband that they're running late and so you're aware of those kind of things but sometimes things happen that just you you can't predict yeah you cannot anticipate everything you yeah. cannot anticipate every crazy thing that pops into somebody's head. Speaking of crazy things, <laughs> you went through a crazy thing, what, a year or two ago? Was it two, three years ago? Uh, about three years ago. Three now. years ago? Yeah. Tell the people the story. All right. And, and, and tell them the details because this absolutely insane. It is insane. It, it is the craziest thing that ever happened to me on the road. I was traveling east on, on 78 in Pennsylvania. And uh, a, a guy going the same direction I was wanted to use the center median as a turnaround point rather than getting off the next exit. And rather than waiting for me to pass him, he turned left to use the median right in front of me. He just turned left. Yeah. He was in the right-hand lane. I was in the left-hand lane, and he turned left. I was doing 65 miles an hour, and I hit him in the side. Yeah. That is, and he was 520 feet from the exit. Jeez. He was one-tenth of a mile. He was right at the mile marker. I could not believe this. I could not believe it was happening when it happened. And it was horrifying because I'm doing 65 miles an hour and he just turned and he was just totally sideways on the road when I hit him, which thankfully nobody was really hurt. I could not believe that nobody was hurt. He was hauling something though. He was hauling something. What was he hauling in that trailer? <laughs> he was he was hauling grills and cans of gasoline <laughs> and propane tanks for the grills <laughs> and nothing exploded. Man. Nothing. Thank God for that. You were in a brand new tractor, weren't you? I was. I had just gotten my new truck not too long before that. Jeez. Uh, maybe six months. 
and uh, it was horrifying. Yeah, it was really horrifying. I I can imagine. I I remember you. I think you text me I what did. happened, yeah. and uh, you. Te- I think you text me a picture, and I was stunned. I was yeah. stunned because your truck was messed up, Big and time. when then when you told me what he was hauling, I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" Nothing exploded. Yeah, nobody died. <laughs> it it was it was amazing. When I look at the pictures that I took, yeah, and I look at where where some of these uh, gas cylinders wound up at, you know, the propane tanks, right next to my tires, right next to my drive tires, right next to my steer tires. Mm. I mean, it, it you know, it was just amazing that nothing happened. That yeah. nobody and and he wasn't physically hurt, really. I mean, he got a, a bump on the head, and a, and a small cut on his head, and that was it. And I had absolutely nothing, and I was totally surprised because. I, I I couldn't see anything. The hood popped up over top of the windshield. Oh you my gosh! See it yet. I was just totally blind. It just it was horrifying. It was totally horrifying. That had to be so scary. Like I can't imagine the feeling of the hood popping up like that, and literally you're in the middle of an accident, and you can't even see where the accident's going. Yep, you got that right. And I wound up straight as an arrow, sticking right in the middle of the median. Thankfully, you know wow. we didn't jackknife and you know do anything else. It just, it's it, and and that's where you don't, you people don't understand what they're doing on the road. Yeah. When they make a decision to do something like that, people just don't think. They don't think of the consequences. They don't think of what's going on around them. They have a goal in mind, and they think they're safe. Mm-hmm. Everybody else will watch out for me. Yeah. And everybody can't watch out for you. Yeah. You have to take responsibility for yourself. You know, and I think that's something that we hopefully can bring a perspective to, to anybody that's listening that maybe isn't a driver, a, a CDL driver is maybe our perspective. Yeah. Because, you know, when I first started driving trailer, I just assumed, and this is a young kid, you mm-hmm. know, I, I was in, I was in my 20s, but I just had this idea. I was like, I'm a huge truck. If you don't see me coming, you're stupid. Well, Apparently, there's a lot of stupid people out there then, you know? <laughs> yes. It, it, it's just like, I, I couldn't fathom the idea of having a, a huge wreck because I'm huge. Right. How like, did you not how, see me? How do you not see me? Yeah. But it happens all the time. Now that I'm in the industry and I talk to drivers and stuff, it happens all the time. Yes, it does. And and there are drivers out there. And if you're a driver listening that you do this, I would encourage you to stop doing it. There are drivers out there that I, I pass on the turnpike and they're watching Netflix on their phone, on their dashboard. Yep. And it's like, you know, there, there are certain things that we as drivers can do to prevent these accidents as well, right? Yes. But um, a lot of times people just get so reckless around us drivers and I don't think they truly comprehend the damage that happens when we connect with them. Uh, I was, this is right around Christmas time and it was a, a rainy night. I'm coming down Route 100 and heavy, heavy, heavy traffic, very heavy traffic. And I am passing, I'm in the in the right-hand lane passing an on-ramp and there was a car trying to get on. Well, it's raining. I'm going 50 and a 55 because there's heavy traffic all around me. Mm-hmm. I can't get over. Sorry, you're going to have to put on your brakes, like the sign says, yield, right. and wait until you can merge into traffic. And I went by and I could tell just by the body, like I said earlier, the body language of the car, you could tell they wanted to edge edge out in front of me, but they just didn't have the guts to do it. I'm glad they didn't, Right. but it pissed them off. And he got on the highway and he caught up to me, gets in front of me and he like hovers right next to my driver's door. And I, and I, I see who it is. I could tell because I, I, I could tell when I passed the car, I was like, this might be somebody it might give me a problem later. It just, those are things you kind of pick up as a driver. Yep, you just kind of see it. And I saw the car come up next to me and I'm like, he's kind of just hovering there and I'm not really paying attention to looking down at him and stuff. I'm in heavy, heavy traffic. And he lets cars get space in front of him. Mm -hmm. And so now there's line up behind him and then he speeds up real fast and cuts me off to the point that I literally could only see the first half of his car because the back half was so close to my hood, I couldn't see him. Wow. And then he hit his brakes. And so I hit my brakes. Right. And I'm cussing up a storm. I I grabbed my air horn. I yanked it so hard. I pulled the cord right out of the ceiling. (laughs) 
<laughs> and and I and you know I didn't hit him. Um, right. But that trip back to my terminal that day, that happened to me twice by two different people. Wow, the same exact scenario. And I already had a broken horn from the first one. Right. <laughs> and and I was so mad and so pissed off because those are two people that I could have killed. Yes. Because they truly, because they're rushing around doing Christmas shopping. It was really close to the Christmas. And they're, they're mad. They didn't find this, that, and the other. The kids are crying. They got to make dinner. Their life sucks because they're, they have their own thing going on. Right. And- they're, they have the road rage and they do something that could have truly ended their life. People have to understand that if I would have rear-ended any of those cars going 50 miles an hour like that, right? they're eating my bumper. Yes. They're, they'd be lucky if they're in the car when it's over. Yes. And, and I don't think people truly understand that because it's like, well, hit your brakes. Like I'm pulling... Uh, 45,000 pounds of freight. I just can't right. hit my brakes and stop on a dime like a Toyota Corolla can. That's exactly right. And it was raining right. and it was heavy traffic. And so I've been fortunate that I haven't had a major accident and God willing, it never comes my way. Amen. But it's a sobering reminder talking to other drivers and having them share their stories and their experiences of what they've been through and you know even for you i mean how long were you driving roughly from the time you got your cdl to the time that you had your first accident with that which was crazy on 78 i mean that was like 20 plus years of driving where you didn't yeah. have any problems right right never had a problem before i mean and it just takes one driver one person to make a decision to do something as foolish as that and it's it's not and you understand people are in their own little world you understand that people are, you know, they they have their things going on. Their mind is is distracted, and that's why it's it's so much harder doing this job, because you have to think for them. You have to anticipate what they're going to do, and you're thinking, okay, what's this driver coming on the on ramp going to do? Is he going to slow down, or is he going to try and get in front of me? Yeah. What's this guy coming up on my left hand side going to do? Is he going to try and cut over in front of me? Is he going to give me enough space? You know, you're always thinking. You have to constantly be thinking, weighing out the situation and looking for a way out just in case you need it. Yeah. And sometimes there's just no way out. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere to go. Yeah. You have to make a decision. And and sometimes the decision is we're going to hit. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the decision you want. Right, right. You try and avoid it. But like in my situation. I had no choice. I mean, there was there was nothing I was going to do. I'm doing 65 miles an hour. Yeah. And somebody turns left in front of you on the highway. How do you anticipate somebody doing that? It's illogical. Yeah, especially 520 feet from the exit. Mm -hmm. 520 feet from the exit. And you turn left instead of taking the exit to the right. Yeah. And you can't anticipate those things. Yeah. And that's, what, that's the thing I would, uh, above all things, that's the thing I want to get across to people. To, to the people in the four wheelers who aren't thinking, think. Yeah. When you get behind that wheel, you are now driving something. You're driving a 2,500 pound missile down the road. Mm -hmm. It can either be a car or it can be a missile. It mm -hmm. just depends on how you use it. That's how I view it too. I, I really do. Like my job is to drive 70,000 pound nuke down the highway around a bunch of 2,500 pound missiles and not make contact with any of them yeah like it's really like that i mean it is like that. it's and i i drive in the philadelphia area very high traffic uh yes. lots of angry drivers you know uh, east coast were uptight and screw but, you you know <laughs> really the city of brotherly love yeah yeah it is but <laughs> we we do love each other right but anyways yeah. um it, it it is uh an interesting world that we live in when it comes to driving for a living. Um, I want to ask you, how do you cope with that kind of those kind of situations where you're dealing with, and not an accident, but just mm -hmm. you're out in the road and there are drivers doing crazy things around you and it does get irritating. Right. Uh, for me, the way I cope is now we don't get paid the same. You get paid by the mile. I get right. paid by the hour. So for me, 
I'm getting paid to drive slower because you're doing stupid crap. Right. And for me, that I've been able to trick my mind in a sense where I don't really get a whole lot of road rage anymore, mm -hmm. uh, except for that one time. But that was like I was I thought I was going to kill somebody. But like if you're just doing crazy stuff for me, it's like I'm getting paid to hit the brakes right now, you know. So it doesn't bother me like like maybe it would have you know when I was younger. Right. Um, but as somebody who you're not getting paid to to drive like a snail, you're getting paid to cover miles, get the freight to one place to another, and you're dealing with really crazy drivers out on the road. Uh, over time and stuff, how how have you kind of come to deal with that to you know manage your sanity? You know, one of the things you have to remember is that you don't get a paycheck if you don't get home. Mm -hmm. And so you learn, and it, it's taken me a long time to learn that. But it's better to slow down and take a little bit extra time. Yeah, I, I'm going to make the same amount of money whether I do it in three hours or whether I do it in four hours. Yeah. But I want to get home. And so that that is, a, that, that is the key. You mm -hmm. get home safely without anybody else getting hurt, without you getting hurt. Because my paycheck doesn't mean anything if I don't make it home. So yeah, that that's the thing that keeps my mind that that occupies it when when you get that that road rage person who comes on the highway and they're mad because somehow you got in front of them and you know you slowed them down for five minutes. You know they're going to come around. They're going to shoot you the finger. They're going to slam on their brakes. They're going to let you know they're irritated. And I just slow down, back out of it, let them have it. Yeah. They can have the road because. I'm still going to get to my destination. Maybe five minutes, it, you know, take me five minutes more to get there, but I'm going to get there and I'm going to get there in one piece because that, that's the goal. I want to do something as, as quickly, if I can say it that way, but as safely as possible. Yeah. And sometimes that just means being the, the, the bigger person, being the more adult, being the adult on the highway and backing out of it and just saying it's yours. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll let you go. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna wrestle you for this. This isn't worth it. Because some sometimes we don't think that. We do let our emotions get us, and we do get. You know, we're we're people too. Truck drivers are people too. You know, we we get emotional. We get frustrated. We're you know we're on the road all the time, and you have to keep your mind about yourself. Yeah, because what I learned three years ago was that you may not make it home. You know, when you have some, just because somebody's in a hurry, they're not thinking, they're not, you know, they're responding out of an emotion that rush hour is, is a crazy time. People are either on their way to work or trying to get home from work. And so you understand that and you try and back out. Yeah. That's the best thing to do is always just relinquish to someone else if you need to, because a death is not worth it, not yours or theirs. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I I just, for me, I, I just try to keep my head on a, a swivel in the truck and, yeah. you know, just try to be aware as much as that. Because if you're not getting caught off guard, you're not getting pissed off as much either. That's true. You know, if you can see it's going to happen, you're prepared for it. And yeah. it's almost like you pat yourself on the back and be like, I knew that was going to happen. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I knew that person was going to do that. Yeah. Yep, I could tell. And yeah. it's like, yeah, I guess I'm gaining that experience then, you know. And that's it. I mean, you know. I, I've been, I'm coming up on, oh man, I can't remember. I got my CD, my, I got my first CD out of class B when I was 21. And I've been, I can't remember how long I've been driving trailer now. But, you know, over time you just being out in the roads for a living driving and yeah. you just you learn you yeah. learn and um you know when i was a kid uh you were at johnson and uh you had something happen to you that i always thought was um it kind of it kind of made you a a badass in my mind you you tore your acl oh yeah and, and yeah you, i did some knee damage <laughs> but you finished the day and you yes. and you you uh, drove a, a manual transmission trailer back in the 90s with a torn ACL. Yes. Tell us about this story. <laughs> what, like, how did this whole thing happen? I was making a delivery to a, a pool place, a pool table place down in uh, right around just below Reading on, off of 422. And I was unloading the stuff and I felt my knee pop and it, you know, you, you could feel it. 
I just feel like this rip go right across my knee and it was just it was painful as all get out i fell off the the back of the truck held onto my knee but i knew i had to get the rest of the day done so i <laughs> closed the back door hobbled up into the truck and i used I, I pushed the clutch in with my foot with my hand pushing on my knee <laughs> oh my God. all afternoon it was a rough afternoon i'd say and so. i didn't get done until eight o'clock at night and then i had to go over to the hospital and then i was out of work for a couple of weeks yeah, yeah. but yeah those are some of the things that you do that you know that's the job yeah that's the job see things have changed though because <laughs> nowadays nobody's expecting a driver to do something like that you know well, nowadays we have automatic trucks that's true too. <laughs> I mean, that's true too it, it that seems true. crazy uh, listen when i first started driving the thing i was most nervous about is learning how to shift mm -hmm. uh these trucks because it's not like a car anybody who uh, drives a car manual transmission you think you could drive a trailer it's not the same thing it's just not and uh i i was nervous about it and shortly after I got my my trailer license and uh, you know, driving truck, I started hearing that other companies are starting to bring in automatic tractors, like an automatic tractor. Right. Like what 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 is that? And then we started getting them. Yep. And, I, and then I find out that, you know, a lot of these schools are training drivers on automatic tractors. And yep. so when they graduate, they never learned how to drive manual. It's scary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, to me, it's like, well, what? What's the point of learning how to drive trailer if you're not going to know how to actually drive the tractor part? Like, right? I mean, anybody can push a button that has a D on it and push a gas pedal and turn a wheel and just drive the tandems. Make sure you're not rolling anything over with your tandems. You know, right? Like that. That's not that. But like the the idea of learning how to shift and the distraction that that is when you first learn how to do it. Like I mean, you're focusing on how to shift and high low gears and double clutching because when you're learning how to drive trailer in school, they're going to teach you how to double clutch. I know yes. most drivers are floating gears and everything, whatever. But when you're learning, you're learning had double clutch so you're doing this whole new pattern of shifting yep while you're driving this giant truck down the road around traffic it prepares you it gives you a whole new element of preparation when it comes to knowing how to actually drive trailer yes it does and i just found it so fascinating that 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 was the case and uh and i guess the companies are starting to adjust to to that because i guess the industry needs drivers and so if the drivers can only drive automatic then we're just going to get automatic trucks i guess i guess that's the way it's going to be it it's it's kind of a it's a strange thing because we you know like you said we have some at work we have, we're getting to be you know a lot more at work at my I terminal mean, we have a lot mine is the truck i drive is still a standard and i and Me i too. like that I, yeah. I, I i for some reason i like having a standard transmission i like to be able to shift the gears mm -hmm. i don't know if i really trust an automatic in the snow on the ice you know what i mean it's different it yeah i've been it, there it's different yeah, that's what i mean it, it, it's one of those things that's like i don't know you know i know when i need to shift or what i want to you yeah. know and so anyway you get that feel for it and you you enjoy the there's that that aspect of it that that is like this is something that most people don't do you know mm -hmm. and now they're kind of taking that away yeah you know i i, I can tell you that one of the nice things about it is it's a lot easier to drink coffee and steer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. They're coffee drinking trucks, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's, it is nice when you just, you know, you pull the armrest up and you have your cup in your right hand, you're just sipping on it, driving with the left hand steering, and it's just easy, easy, easy. Yeah. And uh, I can imagine it in traffic oh, in the city. Oh, for you know, sure. Yeah, you're, for sure. Yeah, you know, what you guys do during the daytime. Yes. Yeah. That, that is nice. Um, I, I drive a, a, a manual uh, as well. And, but when my truck goes down, because I drive, I'm always driving an old tractor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my choice for sure. One, I, I don't really care for sharing a whole lot. And right. if I had to share with the line haul guy that, you know, that it's just, I don't mix good with people. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, and also an older truck means that I can move my stuff in there because nobody else wants it. And so I have all these old manuals and, um, 
you know, it, it it's nice having, but when the truck goes down because of the being an old truck and mm -hmm. it breaks down, uh, I, a lot of times I'm in a newer truck that's, you know, automatic and it takes some time because like you get in the, you ghost clutch. So like you get in the right. truck, you sit down and you <laughs> just, done that. you wind up kicking through the floor to get the truck going. And you're like, whoa, there's no, <laughs> <that's> right. <laughs> and so like you almost tear your ACL again, just trying to <laughs> push on a clutch that's not there. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, but it, when you're in the traffic, it is nice that you just kind of, oh, whatever, you right. know, just whoop, push the gas and go for it a little bit. Just move. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I tell you, it, it's, it's an interesting life. It's an interesting job. Um, no matter what my future holds as far as careers go, if I ever do move away from driving, like say, because I, I don't know if I mentioned it before to the audience, but I, I do have another podcast and it's it's a pretty big podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called The Confessionals. It's a paranormal show where we interview people on their paranormal experiences. And, um, you know, if, if you know, God were to bless me in the sense that I could be a full time podcaster. Um, I, I would take it because it's uh, it, it puts me around my family more. It's yeah, a lot definitely. a lot easier on my body, all that stuff. Sure. Uh, but I would really miss the driving. Yeah, I wouldn't miss the deliveries, the BS around the job, all that stuff. But the driving, just being behind the wheel, knowing you're out there on the road and you are the professional out there yeah and, and and when you take it to heart and you take it for what it is and, you, and you're serious about it you can take pride in that yes and i no matter what happens in my future i would always reminisce driving yeah because i love it absolutely love it and i think uh most drivers out there have at least some kind of similar feeling towards their job some of them it doesn't matter what's going on they love every aspect of it right <laughs> you know right. but um i think most drivers that are out there can at least say that they truly love being behind that wheel yeah there's a sense down. of independence in there yeah you know there, there there is a sense of of uh a certain amount of freedom even though you you know you need to really pay attention it is that you are the person in control, you know, where it's going. I, I love doing what I do. Yeah. I'm blessed to do what I do. God has really blessed me with a great job, with a great company, and I enjoy that. And it, and with that comes a good paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been able to raise a family, take care of my kids, take care of my wife, do the things that I, that I need to do and do the things that I want to do. You know, it's not a nine to five job. No. It is definitely not a nine to five job, but there is a passion in there to do something that is different, to do something that is is, is beyond different mm -hmm. and at times dangerous. Yeah. You know, and that, that those are the times it's not as fun. When it's when it's dangerous, it's not as fun. But all that being said, it's a great job. Yeah. And I would recommend it, and I do recommend truck driving to a lot of people. Because I think it's a great job. I think mm -hmm. it's a great life. For sure. And I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we're going to get wrapping this up here. I wanted to take the first 30 to 40 minutes of this um, this show just to kind of let the audience know a little bit about us and hear us chop it up together a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hear some of our experiences. And you've had more experiences than me, but, hey, you've been driving longer. <laughs> I've been out for a lot longer. And, and I, I have stories and stuff that I could share, but we could make this a three-hour show if we keep talking and stuff. Right. Um, there's plenty of time to, to do this again. Um, but I wanted the audience to be familiar with us and get to know us a little bit. Uh, but now let's bring on kevin and kevin is going to be sharing his experiences with uh driving on the road we're going to talk to kevin about some of his experiences and how he got into trucking and some of the wild things that he's seen so uh kevin how you doing man i'm very well thank you tony good so kevin where are you from Fenland falls ontario the jewel of the Corth is about 90 minutes north of toronto Awesome. Yeah, I've never, I've only been to Canada one time, and that was for uh, my honeymoon. We went to Niagara Falls, and uh, it. I never was a big fan of doing a whole lot of traveling. I don't like flying and stuff. So, uh, me and my wife, when we 
decided when we got married, we decided to drive up to Canada from Philadelphia. So it's about an eight hour drive and stuff. But um, it was a nice drive with my new bride and things like that. But I, I loved I loved it up there. Everybody's so friendly. Well, there's so much more to see in Canada. Like that's just the beginning of it. Like like anybody that really wants a, a, a great holiday or an adventure, come to Canada. There is so much to see if you want to fish, hunt, anything you want to do. There's millions of acres just waiting for you. Yeah. I, I Well, I know I talk to a lot of different people all over the world. And uh, outside of the United States, I probably say the most popular country that I talk to people in is Canada. And uh, people just, they, they love that country, man. Like if you're from Canada, I mean, a lot of people just love uh, their, love it there, the nature. I mean, there's lots of nature up there. And uh, I wouldn't mind making a trip up there one day. I always liked hiking and getting deep into the woods. And I know Canada has lots of wilderness. Oh, lots and lots. Like I say, whatever you're into, there's something here for you. So how long have you been driving? 46 years. I started the fall of 1973. Wow, 46 years. 1973. So you started uh, 11, no, 12 years before I was even born. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is that I don't really have any intentions of ever stopping. As a matter of fact, I'm wheeling and dealing right now on my next tractor. Um, my father drove till he was 75, so I would imagine I'll make it at least that far. That's awesome. Now, uh, I'm assuming you do over the road? Uh, I have. Uh, that My next job will be running Florida out of Ontario because we just got six inches of wet snow last night, and I'm sick of the snow. My wife and I oh. want to get down south. And, uh, but I've pretty much done everything. Uh, one of my favorite jobs was, was doing oversize, uh, you know, 140 foot girders with a six axle steering dolly and a three axle Jeep and a three axle tractor. And I think pretty much I've done a little bit of everything. Yeah. You know, I've always wanted to try over oversized driving. Now I drive LTL and so it's a lot of stop and go, stop and go. I mean, I do like 15 to 20 deliveries a day and then I do pickups and it's just a hustle all day long. And yep, done too. yeah, when, when I drive down the road and I come across, you know, the guys coming down with the oversized loads and stuff, it just looks like a challenge. And it's something that I've just always been inter interested in giving it a sh giving it a shot. But you know, it's one of those things where I don't even know how I would even get involved in doing it, you know? You just got to find the right carrier that's willing to train you. Be patient. Read your permits. You know, take your time. Double check everything. And it, it, it'll always come together. You, you're, there's always one guy at every company that will take the extra five or ten minutes to, to show you how to do something, you know, to, to uh, you know, catch your little mistakes. You know, he'll take, he'll take a little bit of his time to say, well, maybe we try it like this. It'll work better. It'll be safer. That's the guy you want to hang out with. Yeah, that's you know that's something that you usually get a lot at different places you go to work at. I mean, I've worked at a lot of different places, and it's always like one guy that will you know stick around and help you out and stuff. And then there's a lot of people that just hey, figure it out yourself. You know, <laughs> and it's it's uh, well, that's, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And when I but you, but you know, it's 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 a type of industry that that uh, anybody can drive a truck. Not many people can drive it well. And the people that have drive, can drive it well, they're, they're teaching the other people how to learn to do it properly. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, me driving LTL, we go through a lot of drivers. And I find that we have a hard time finding good drivers. And then when you find a good driver to make sure that they're clean and are not on drugs is another thing, because that's another thing. I don't know if that's everywhere, but uh, I know that there's times that there are terminals, like there's companies that actually look to, you know, spread their wings and build a new terminal in a new location kind of thing. And they've had to shut down new terminals because they can't find clean drivers. I mean, that's a, that's a real problem these days. Well, see, now the problem is in Ontario, marijuana is legal. And if we uh, cross the border to run stateside, we have to do a urine test. Well, how can you, how can you do something in Ontario that's totally legal and expect to run stateside? Because when they do your random urine test, they're going to catch you and they're going to shut you down. Yeah. So how's that work up there, man? Because I've I've actually been curious about that. Now they're they're flirting with it here in the states. I know uh, California, Oregon, Washington, they are legal uh, for recreational use. And where I'm at in Pennsylvania, it's not legal. But they are talking about how it's probably going to become legal within the next ten years. Now, as a trucker, are you able to to enjoy you know smoking some weed and stuff up in Canada? Actually, well, I, I'm not a smoker. I'm not. But from what I understand that, that you can get it through the mail now or through UPS or something, that the Canadian government is our drug dealer now. And 
you're allowed to grow. I've heard different figures. I've heard two plants, five plants for personal use right in your own backyard. Now they've, they're, they're concentrating now on starting to find um, some sort of a test to, you know, roadside test to see if that you're impaired when you've been smoking marijuana. You know, of course you'll have the same, same implications as, uh, as drunk driving, which is probably a good thing. I sure. see nothing wrong with somebody taking a Friday night or a Saturday night and, and biting as long as, you know, come Sunday night when they go to work, they're, they're sober. Exactly. And, you know, I, I kind of, I never smoked marijuana in my entire life. And the main reason I wasn't like a, a straight and narrow guy, but the main reason was I didn't know what the effect would be on my body. And I knew if I came home high, my dad could tell he would have beat me senseless. <laughs> so <laughs> I was just like, well, he smelled on you. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just like, I'm going to stay away from that. But, uh, as an adult, you know, I've learned more and more about the positive benefits of marijuana, the health benefits, especially they, they nowadays they can take out the hallucinogens in it. So you don't even like get a hallucination from it. And there's just a lot of medical benefits to this thing that is literally a seed you put in the ground, you sprinkle some water on it and it grows a plant. And well, that, yeah, you know, you know, some Tony, like, like I, I kind of have an issue with the government telling us that we can't do something that's our choice that we grow from the ground. Like, I mean, I think that's an overreach of government myself. I think that if I, if, if I chose to grow five plants in my backyard and smoke it, it's my business. As long, long as I go to work and I'm sober, as far as I'm concerned, the government has nothing to say about it. But unfortunately, the government doesn't listen to me. Right. Yeah. And I'm, just, I'm the same way because I start, what I, the way I started thinking about it was, how is it that the government can say that they, there can be 10 people in this lab over here that are cooking up this drug that they put in a pill form. And as long as it has this stamp of approval by the government on it, it's okay to take and consume. But something as natural as marijuana, which is a plant that just grows out of the ground, nothing else added to it, is illegal. And it just, when you break it down like that, it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, it's, it's like, like insulin. The, uh, the, the price of insulin has just skyrocketed because... These people, they've gone out, they, they've changed the formula, from what I understand from listening to the radio, okay? They've changed the formulas, and they've gone out, they've got a hundred different patents that surround that changed formula to um, protect themselves from other people making an insulin-like type product. And look what they did with the, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that pen you stab yourself with, you get stabbed with the bee, like they're, what, $700 now? You know, I, I can't remember what it is, the blue to the sky, a happy pen, my wife just said. Oh, yeah. You know, like, like. Yeah, I mean, like, like it's all profits. If, believe me, if there was some way that they could make themselves multi-bazillionaires off of marijuana, believe me, it would have been done 25 years ago. Yeah, I think it's a lot of uh, fighting through politics and things like that. But, um, you know, I, I'm pretty much a, a supporter of the legal, legalization of it and stuff. Uh, and it should be treated like, you know, alcohol, where you, you shouldn't have it in your system uh, to this certain level while you're driving and certain ages shouldn't be allowed to have it. Just, you know, have right. those kind of rules and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I'm, common sense rules. Common yeah. sense rules. If for the longest time, I was really like, I, I thought of myself as a conservative. Um, but the older I get, the more I realize I'm more of a libertarian where it's like, I just don't think the government should tell me how to live my life. And if I'm not harming anybody, they shouldn't be in my business. I agree with you. I, uh, <coughs> excuse me, socially, I do lean left. Financially, I'm, I'm, I lean right. But uh, like at the end of the day, it's all about uh, what I choose to do with my life and my family. You know, we, uh, we shouldn't have to follow the dictates of, uh, you know, like a, like a government that, that doesn't agree with us, like that's trying to control us more than represent us. Right. I, my I opinion, to, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I used to drive for a different company and uh, one of the drivers there, him and I had gotten into a conversation and uh, he was much older. I mean, I was probably in my early 20s at this time and he was in his 50s and he was an extreme uh, libertarian where like he would t he was telling me the government shouldn't be involved in our lives, this, that, and the other. I'm like, okay, and stuff. And, and I started asking questions and he would get down to the point where it's like, I shouldn't have to stop at a red light if I don't want to. It's not their business. I'm like, but you're putting people in harm's ways. Like if I feel it's safe to cross that intersection, I shouldn't have to stop at a red light. And I'm just like, are you crazy, dude? You should not be no, driving that's, truck. That's an extreme. That's an extreme, yeah. but I, I do, I do share some of his feelings, but you know, if, 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 again, if, if I choose to smoke, which I don't, or if I choose to have a drink, which I don't, that's my choice. It's, it's, and I have to accept the circumstances of my actions if I do something wrong because of it. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. And uh, it's it's just a lot of self-responsibility that I think people um, don't even have to enforce sometimes because the government does it for them. So, uh, but I'll tell you what, Kevin, you have, uh, you've had, um, obviously, I'm sure you've had lots of different experiences out on the road over the years and stuff. You've probably seen uh, crazy things. And this, this show is about people coming on and sharing some of their stories and experiences from the road. Uh, and you and I connected on Facebook and it turns out, you know, a, a while ago, not too, too re- recently, but I, I think it was, you said it was back in the seventies or something. You actually saw a guy uh, commit suicide while you were driving. What happened there? Well, I was working for a company called Concord leasing and anybody from Canada will, re- will recognize the name. Then they went to Concord transport and they're gone now. And I was driving a, uh, a Ford Louisville day cap and I would load glass for uh, cars out of Scarborough, Ontario, run it down to Finley, Ohio, five days a week, which in a day cap gave me about 3,200 miles a week, which is a pretty big week for, wow. you know, I think I was about 20 years old, somewhere around there. So occasionally, uh, they would give me a backhaul out of the Detroit area. So one day up near the, I'm not sure of the, the name of the, uh, where they used to play baseball up there on the east side of Detroit there around 75 and 94, there was a, a baseball diamond there. And uh, I went into a, an old warehouse there and I loaded a load of cowhides. And I was taking that back to Toronto. And it took me most of the day to load a load of cowhides, like July, August, uh, you know, like a nice summer day, nice clear sunny day. So I finally get my load on, I get my customs papers done. And uh, I started heading towards the bridge and a little bit, I was lucky there was a little bit of a lineup at the cash box, but not much. I mean, a matter of a couple of minutes. So I'd start climbing the hill uh, for the Ambassador Bridge, which is a pretty big pull, right? Like I was grossed out. Oh, I was, I was overloaded for the States. I was probably up around 90,000 pounds. And I'm pulling up the bridge. And, and you know, in that scene for the 70s show where, where Eric's sitting on the hood of his car, you know, that, that Vista Cruiser, that big station wagon yeah. with the spoken windshield on the top? One of those goes roaring past me as I'm climbing the hill. I'm up near the top. And, uh, all, I mean, the reason I noticed him when he had his, when he went past me, he had his foot right to the floor and with those two barrel carburetors and the exhaust, and it would just hiss as it went past you. And I thought, boy, look at him go. So I picked up another gear and I'm climbing the bridge and, uh, which is a pretty good pull. And he pulled over in front of me, just hammered the brakes on and pulled over in front of me. And I went, son of a gun, what's he doing? He put it in park, threw open the driver's door, ran out the side of the car, across the front of it and jumped right off the side of the bridge in front of me, maybe, maybe 50 feet in front of me. And, and the one thing I remember was kind of like, like the uh, Wiley Coyote cartoons, you know, where he falls off a cliff and he kind of pauses there for a second, then he drops out of sight. Yeah. It was exactly like that. Just exactly like that. He just kind of hung there in the, in the air for like a, a split second, you know, his arms and legs all spread out in this, this look on his face that I'll never really forget. And, uh, just dropped out of sight and the car door was open. The car was running. So I went, what am I going to do? You know, like, what do you do? It's not like I can catch him at this point. So I, I, I got in the left lane and I passed him and I, I went up over top of the bridge and I came down to customs and there was a woman Canadian customs officer there. And she goes, citizenship. And I said, somebody just jumped off the bridge. She goes, what do you mean? I said, a, a guy right in front of me just jumped off the bridge. He goes, we'll take care of it. Citizenship. <laughs> and away I went. Wow. So I don't know what it, I would imagine, of course, that they went right up there and, you know, looked for the body and recovered the car. But that's probably one of the stranger things I've seen. Jeez. And, and the, yeah. just the nonchalant attitude, we'll take care of it. Citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> My well, yeah, Lord. That, that to me was, was as, as, shocking as the guy actually done like she was just citizenship somebody just jumped off which oh okay we'll take care of it. citizenship wow you know, like i guess they had enough people jumping that it was it wasn't anything special yeah i mean I, that's what it makes it sound like it sounds like you know okay we had another jumper okay we'll take care of it. we'll go sweep up the car and uh see if we can find the body you know yeah yeah i mean by that point you know the, the current would have taken them so yeah that's, but that was a long time ago just something i always remembered yeah, that's that's pretty incredible. Uh, when you saw him jump off the bridge, uh, obviously it's something that you you probably were like, did I just see what I thought I saw? Uh, did, how did how did that affect you though? Did it affect you knowing that you just witnessed somebody uh, commit suicide? Did it have any effect on your psyche at all? 
No, like it never really affected me that way, but it's something I've always remembered. Like it's the one thing if we ever have conversations around the truck, you know, the, the counter at a truck stop, it's one of the first things I bring up because it's the, the first one in my memory, right? I can't imagine seeing that, man. And I, I wouldn't wish anybody to have to witness people uh, wanting to take their own life like that. Have you ever had, uh, and I, I know guys don't really like talking about it and stuff, but um, I talk about mine. Uh, have you ever had it, had an accident that kind of like stood out to you as like, man, if I would have just made that this turn a little sooner, this person wouldn't have been there that cut me off or something like that. Was there ever any situations that you found yourself in driving that you're just like, man, I wish I would have you know been five minutes behind or five minutes ahead of time and that wouldn't have happened? No, you know what? I accept things for, for the way they are. What happens, happens, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not a real believer in fate. I just believe that we live a life and things happen, right? Um, a bunch of years, I was in Indiana, a bunch of years ago, I was in Indiana going down 37, beautiful, hot, sunny day. I was empty. I had my, my full 10 hours off. Um, everything was great. And I had a, a young woman in a, in a car pull up in front of me and I hit her in the driver's door. Uh, she went through, she was actually stopped at a red light and she put her foot in the gas grill in front of me. She had a one-year-old and a three-year-old in the back seat. Now that one, I remember. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I broke her neck and broke her pelvis and by the grace of God, her children were pretty much un untouched. Wow. That's great. Yeah. And, and, but that, that wasn't my fault. I mean, she was sitting at a red light and she was reading something. She was looking down, reading something in her hands. Lifted her head, looked at me, looked at the light, and put her foot in the gas pedal and drove in front of me as if she was daydreaming. Jeez. So I mean, in in forty six years, I've never had I've never had an at fault accident. I've never had anything that was even close to that. Well, that's that's great. I know. I I mean, I drive around in the Philadelphia area every day, and so it's a high volume of cars and people have you know doing their own thing, and. I mean, I've had so many close calls that I'm just thinking to myself, my Lord, if I was not paying attention there, uh, this person could have been dead by now. And uh, well, it just scares me sometimes. I, uh, years ago, I, I worked for CN Rail out of Brampton, Ontario. And I had a 9200 International. And uh, I put three bumpers on that truck in three months, I think, and not a single one of them was my fault. I had a, I hit a moose in Northern Ontario in Thunder Bay. I hit a big cow and Waked at the front end, and she didn't even knock her off her feet. She walked away thirteen. Wow. Thirteen and yeah, thirteen and a half thousand dollars damage. Uh, I had a young fella spin out a car in front of me and push him down the road sideways in the rain. And then I had a tow truck going the other wheel. A, a, a tire fell off the back of his deck and bounced across the highway and took up my third bumper. Jeez. So yeah, I was just I was just blessed, you know, but not. We never had an at fault. Like I said, in 46 years, never had an at fault ever. That's great. That's good stuff, man. I mean, uh, I know my company, they, uh, they give out, you know, safe driving awards and they have plaques on the wall in the hallway of guys who made it, you know, a million miles, two million miles or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you walk by every day and you're just thinking, one day I hope to be on that plaque. I got a long way to go yet. I'm 33. I didn't make, right. I didn't make the one million mile list, but, <laughs> right, right. Uh, I, I certainly hope that, you know, I can have a record like that where I, I make it that far. Now you, you're probably at the four or five million mile list. You know what? I, I never even thought about it. I, I wouldn't know where to begin to even figure it out. It's, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, like when I started, you'd show up Sunday night to go to work and there was a truck, a trailer with a load on it. They give you your bills in a, in a bunch of cash in an envelope. And we never ran log books in Canada unless you're on the East coast. So we just get in the trucks and go. Like, I mean, I can see in the mid eighties with a two ninety Cummins and a cab over Freightliner furniture all week, leave Friday night and I deliver furniture Monday morning in Calgary. That's 2,200 miles, you know, spring suspension, Armstrong steering, no, no, um, uh, no air conditioning and run 2,200 miles in a weekend. Jeez. So that's the way we all use. Everybody used to run like that. Everybody, everybody. You know, every, every day was uh, as much as you could do. So what's it like up there now? I mean, are you, do you guys have to uh, do the whole logging and stuff? Like down here in the States, we're required to have the e-logs, the electronic log system in the truck and all that stuff. Well, we're, we're still on paper logs, but if you cross the border, you're on an e-log. And I understand the end of this year, the e-logs are supposed to be coming into Canada. Um, you know, it's, I don't like them. Me neither. I, I, 
I strongly disagree with them. I, I think that, uh, um, you know, I, I just think they're unnecessary. I mean, I think they're like, they're coming in in, in the end of the year from what I understand. And, and, uh, we also have the speed limiters for 105 kilometers an hour. Okay. And I think, I think they're dangerous. I really do. So what is that in, in state's terms? I mean, 105 kilometers, I'm not sure what that is in miles per hour. 65 miles an hour. Okay. Yeah. So what happens, what happens, which I see is hap- happening is that a young fellow, you know, like, like, um, he starts up the truck in Toronto and he's, he's going to do a Montreal switch. Well, to do it in a 14 hours of service is, is real tight. So he pulls out of the terminal in Toronto or Brampton, where a lot of them come from now. And he runs that truck up to 65 mile an hour and he holds his foot on the, pe- on the floor for the whole trip. You know, he hits a construction site. He, he roars through it at 65 mile an hour. He gets up beside another truck and he's doing 65 and the other truck's doing, you know, 64 and nine tenths. He'll sit beside that truck forever to get past him. Right. Because everybody is so under the gun to get like to run down to using that trip as an example, to run to Montreal, drop a trailer, pick up a trailer and get back to Toronto that everybody is just maxed out. Like, like as hard as that truck will pull at 65 mile an hour, that's what they're forcing it to do. They're not stopping for breaks. Like if they stop for coffee, it's rare. Yeah, it is dangerous. And we have a similar problem here at my, at, you know, my industry of LTL, uh, which is you have the line haul drivers that are driving overnight and they got the 14 hour window and they'll drive from say the Philadelphia area to Pittsburgh and back. Well, you know, on a summer night, it's doable. But when you have snow that's in, entering into the picture and stuff, you, you got to back it off, especially when you're going through the mountains of Pennsylvania and stuff, you hit a snow squall and all of a sudden yeah. you're, you're spinning out. And, uh, then you have the problem of you, you say you get to the, your location in Pittsburgh and your load's not ready and you're just sitting there waiting while you're on the clock. And it's just like, it, it really does hamper the industry and it makes things unsafe. They think they're making it safer, but by stressing drivers out that need to get loads to certain locations, they're making it more unsafe because they're making guys go under the gun and rush. And that's not what you want, you know, a, a almost a hundred thousand pound vehicle going down the highway doing. That's right. I mean, you see now everybody just is always going as hard and fast as they can. I am opposed to being tracked. Okay. I really hate the idea of being tracked by anybody, but if I have to do it, what I could almost live with and reluctantly live with is put a, uh, put a, um, some sort of a log in my truck that I have nothing to do with. It just, it's in my truck. So I start up in the morning, I run down the road and I do what I got to do. I get home, I shut the truck off. So the only time that's ever looked at is if there's a, an accident or something has happened, then you pull up that information. You got to use it to save my, save me or use it to convict me, but it shouldn't have any effect in what I do today. You should tell me what the rules are and just let me go. You know, and if you want to track me, which again, I'm opposed to, but if that's the compromise that we need to hit, I can almost live with it, you know? So again, if, if, uh, if there's a major fault somewhere, something's happened, you know, then somebody somewhere like my insurance company, my carrier, the DOT, whomever it is can draw that information out of my computer. Reluctantly, I would, I would do that, but I'd really like to see you go back to the old days. Yeah. I, I don't think that's going to happen though. You got a lot of people making laws that have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to trucking and they think it's a great idea and they have no clue because they've never even sat in a truck. Well, it's all lawyer and insurance driven. Yep. It's all, you know, it's all for the lawyers. Like, I mean, if you have an accident now, everywhere we go, there's a great big build, billboard that says, you know, if you've been involved in an accident with an 18 wheeler, you know, you know, call sleazy Bob. And the first <laughs> thing they do is they want to, they want to access your computer, everything and find out what you've done for the last two weeks. Like, I mean, I've never had the experience, but I've heard people that have been involved in an accident and, and two months ago, there was a falsification or a mistake in their logging. And what happened two months ago, they used in that accident that happened today. They said, well, you're not much of an operator if you went, you know, 32 seconds over like two months ago. So you must be a bit of an outlaw, right? And then that's turned the, turn the tide in, in lawsuits over the years. And that's what it's all about is dollars and cents. That's all it is, man. And even like with all these new uh, devices they're putting on trucks and stuff, uh, we have 
it, like in my company, they have these for, forward facing cameras that watch the road and uh, they record when you slam on your brakes, they kick into record mode. Uh, if you if you shift lanes a little bit, there's a buzzer on each side of the truck that will go off if you're getting outside the lane. Uh, there's even like a device, I forget what it's called, but it's on the front of the truck. And if you're on cruise control going down the highway and you start right. getting too close to a vehicle, it will automatically start backing you off, uh, without you touching the brake. And so like, but th- those are all things they're putting in trucks. And I'm sure it's because they get brakes financially on the insurance company end. Well, that's what it is. It's the insurance, you know, they're trying to, uh, keep their insurance bill down as low as possible. And there's no way to do that because, I mean, look at the city you truck in. I mean, it's pretty congested. There's lots of people around. I mean, everywhere you go, you're down narrow streets and narrow docks and yeah. people running and walking and all that, and cars and other trucks. Yep. It's Philadelphia. I've never driven in New York City, and I, I pretty much never will because I just won't do it. <laughs> but uh, driving right. in, in Philadelphia and stuff, I can just say that it's a city that was not built for tractor trailers. It's an old city. No, and no. uh the trucks barely fit in especially like north philadelphia it, it right. is extremely hard to drive around in a tractor trailer and uh you know it is what it is but um you you, you and i'm sure you found this too and stuff if you do something enough you get used to it and uh after you do north philly enough times all of a sudden you're just like yeah it is what it is and then you realize eventually that oh this is actually pretty difficult when somebody else says you, how do you do that? It's like, oh, well, you get used to it, you know? (laughs) Well, New York City is 500 miles basically from Toronto, more or less, depending on where you go. And I'll go to New York City any day of the week, but it's going to cost you $5,000. Yeah. You know, it would be my point of choice. I would do two a week or maybe maybe, uh, three every two weeks, something like that, $5,000 a turn. Um best way to run New York city is, is, uh, with an oversize because they take you in at night. There's less traffic in the, and the, uh, escorts know exactly where you got to go. That's actually kind of easy. Wow. Um, and it usually pays pretty good, but, but I don't mind where I go as long as it pays accordingly. I'm not going to do a freight rate to New York city, like, uh, $2 or $2 and 50 cents a mile to New York city. Absolutely not. I want as much money as I can get. And I want you to pick up all the tolls and the escorts and permits and all that. And, uh, that's my price. Yeah. There's, you know, I'm not a charity. I'm not a charity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I've talked to drivers that, you know, cause I, I've talked to a lot of people and I remember the one time I was talking to another LTL driver and he said that his company sent him into New York city the very first time. And he was going with, he, with a double, uh, he, he drove, he drives for the company old dominion. He just got his, okay. uh, trailer license and, uh, he was going into the city with a double and he went over some bridge he wasn't supposed to go over and he was trying to turn around and he got it all like jackknifed. And he literally in the middle of an intersection had to drop both trailers to straighten it all out and then rehook up once he got straightened out just to get Wait. back. And it's just like he got tickets and fines and he was there for like two hours. Oh, like, yeah. Sounds like a nightmare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've all heard the stories about how you couldn't make that right hand turn because there was a big old Cadillac parked on the corner. And yeah. The cop showed up and said, what are you doing? So I can't get around the corner. Well, I'm telling you right now, drive over top of that Cadillac. You know, I mean, I've heard that story a wow. hundred times. <laughs> or the other one I've heard is, uh, you, you know, it's the sun's going down and you're in the Bronx and, and I'm not going to give you a ticket if you stop at any more red lights. You just go through every red light and get out of here. Wow. I mean, we've all heard those stories about New York city. I haven't. <laughs> Holy crap. No. no, I don't talk to a whole lot of guys that have driven New York city and stuff, but, uh, that's intense. Yeah. That's intense. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, I've heard that story as long as I've been in the industry about the cop that said drive over top of that car. It's parked on the corner. He shouldn't be there. Jeez. I can't imagine a cop saying that to me in Philly, but, um, well, Kevin, let me, let me ask you a question here before we get out of here. Um, what is it now you've been doing, I think you said 46 years, right? Driving truck. Yes. Okay. So for 46 years, you've been driving truck and you've been doing it this long. What is it about it that keeps you going? What is it about trucking that you love enough to keep going the, the length of time you've went and beyond? Well, my dad was a driver and 
I, I, I loved, I've always loved trucks. Always, always loved trucks. When I was a kid, my dad would drive in the driveway and, you know, once a month he'd bring me a new overdrive magazine and we always talked about trucks and I climbed around his trucks and he took me with him. You know, we'd always had a truck in the backyard. Um, you know, my uncle was a truck driver, same way with him. And I just want, I just really wanted to do it. And I've just never really not wanted to do it. I mean, I've, it always hasn't been good to me. That's for sure. I mean, there's been some times where it's been really hard, but I keep going just because, um, it's what I love. I just love doing it. And the thing about it is I've never had to get into a situation where like say driving a tow motor in a factory where, you know, where you're watched by a hundred cameras and you've got somebody yeah. telling you what to do every day. Like I, I love the fact that you tell me what to do and just let me go. And I do what I do. and you know, I, I make the best of it. I, I, my, my biggest pleasure nowadays is coming home. I, that's what, that's what I live for now is coming home. Um, but I've been doing it so long. I can't imagine doing anything else. I totally so can understand. My, my idea of retirement now is to get out of the flat decks and, uh, I'm going to buy another tractor and a reefer and I'm going to run Florida because looking out a window right now, we're, we're snowed in again. And, uh, it's not, it's not snowing in Florida. And my wife and I would like very much to spend time in Florida or someplace warm. It's understandable. So I guess uh, you have plans to make some Florida runs with your wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I found a carrier that, that uh, I can run Florida pretty steady. I'm not going to haul produce. It's going to be frozen food. Uh, this one carrier I'm going to work for, they have 1,500 loads a year coming out of Florida going into Peterborough, which is about an hour from where I live. So there's lots of freight. Um just back and forth. I don't have to, you know, set the world on fire. Just be steady. That's the key. Just get out in there and do, even if I do three trips a month, I'll still be all right. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that, Kevin. And I do appreciate you coming on and talking with us. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, that's a show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed recording it. And we are working on the audio issues. The very first, I'd say, four shows, we were playing with the audio levels and how we were going to do the recording technical side of things. So the audio might be a little different from episode to episode, the very first four episodes. But after that, we should have it pretty much nailed down to a very consistent audio level and sound for you guys to enjoy. And if you did enjoy this episode, please share it around social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok. We don't care where you share the show, but if you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends, even in emails or word of mouth. We don't care. But the best thing you can do at this point is to help us grow the show by sharing the show. So on that note, everybody, thank you for being here. And until next time, keep the hammer down in the hammer lane. Park threw open the driver's door, ran out the side of the car, across the front of it, and jumped right off the side of the bridge in front of me. The only people who really pulled over were truckers. He said, we're going to Hodge, and he didn't slow down. He went across the median onto the oncoming traffic, but where they could see him coming, they just got out of the way. I noticed this plane was really low. He went right in front of us, hit the fence, and it spun around. You know, 30 seconds more, he could have hit us. And I went around that truck, and a guy stepped out from behind the truck and threw a piece of wood, and it shot through my window just like a spear and stuck in the back of the cab of my truck. That's probably one of the stranger things I've seen. 